more pleased to have our next speaker with us today. Gloria Steinem, as you all know, is an iconic visionary of the women's movement. And as we discuss the feminization of poverty today, we are grateful to get this perspective from one of, if not the, best known feminist in American history. Gloria Steinem is a writer, lecturer, editor, and feminist activist. She travels as an organizer and lecturer and is a frequent media spokeswoman on issues of equality. She is particularly interested in the shared origins of sex and race caste systems, gender roles, and child abuse as roots of violence, nonviolent conflict resolution, the cultures of indigenous peoples, and organizing across boundaries for peace and justice. In 1972, Ms. Steinem co-founded Ms. Magazine and remained one of its editors for 15 years. I love that magazine. As a freelance writer, she has been published in Esquire, the New York Times Magazine, and many women's magazines, as well as publications in other countries. Ms. Steinem also helped to found the Women's Action Alliance, a pioneering national information center that specialized in non-sexist, multiracial children's education. The National Women's Political Caucus, a group that continues to work to advance the numbers of pro-equality women in elected and appointed office at a national and state level. Voters for Choice, a pro-choice political action committee. And Choice USA, a national organization that supports young pro-choice leadership and works to preserve comprehensive sex education in school. Her books include the bestsellers Revolution from Within, a book of self-esteem, Outrageous Acts and Everyday Rebellions, I love that title, Moving Beyond Words, and Marilyn, Norma Jean. Ms. Steinem graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Smith College. Having worked there, I know they're very, very proud of her and her career. She now lives in New York City and is currently at work on Road to the Heart, America as if Everyone Mattered, a book about her more than 30 years on the road as a feminist organizer. Please join me in welcoming Gloria Steinem. So, you know, I think, and I have to say, 
I'm especially grateful for the feminization of poverty as a phrase because it caused me to think about the masculinization of wealth. And without <laughs> attacking the masculinization of wealth, we are never going to solve the feminization of poverty. We used to sit in Ms. Magazine meetings, editorial meetings, and uh, you know we were being challenged at the time by people uh, who said that women slept their way to wealth and power. And so we thought, well, that's interesting, by any means necessary. Let's see if there are <laughs> women. So we tried to make a list, you know, of people. <laughs> and actually what we found was women who slept their way to good dental care, food, a nice house, <laughs> you know, but not power. What we discovered was it's sons-in-law who sleep, and men in general who sleep their way to power. Because what happened was that patriarchal families of, inher of great inherited wealth uh, pass that wealth through the men. And uh, it's sort of, <laughs> I think of it sort of as like hemophilia, it goes through women and men get it. <laughs> but you think about the New York Times passes that down that way, restaurant, I mean, you know, there's these huge fortunes that pass, pass that way. Um, so we ultimately made a list of sons-in-law who had slept their way to power, because what happens in families where there are no uh, sons, perish the thought, they can't possibly consider daughters usually to be, to be the heirs. And so they have to look for a son-in-law uh, to take over the business. Uh, and once I went to speak at the Young Presidents Organization, do you know this organization is supposed to be men who are presidents of huge companies before or uh, I guess it's up to 35, I think, before 35. Uh, and I believed it, you know. I thought, oh, that's amazing. But I discovered that actually they were like 80% family owned companies and sons in law. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I do think, but I do think in a much more serious way, we have to think and talk and talk and talk about the masculinization of wealth. Uh, I'm very grateful to Occupy for pointing out the 1%. And there were many women who were part of Occupy who immediately started Occupy Patriarchy, which was great. Uh, but I think we need to name the fact that when Elizabeth Warren said, as she did yesterday, that if the minimum wage kept up with productivity, it would be uh, $22 an hour now. Um, and the difference between what it really is and the $22 an hour is $14.25. Who has the $14.25? Ah, I think we know. Walmart <laughs> has it, right? The Koch brothers have it. Uh, the insurance industry has it since they persist in uh, gender segregating their actuarial tables and it's still often the case that a woman who doesn't smoke pays more each month than a man who does smoke because, and that incidentally is what stopped the Equal Rights Amendment. It was the, that part of the insurance industry that didn't want to stop gender segregating their actuarial tables. So I'm very grateful for this phrase, thank you, Diane, feminization of art, which starts us thinking in enormous ways, and I'm and uh, I'm glad that we're thinking in terms of new words too, because life to me is just one long editorial meeting. <laughs> and so perhaps in our uh, discussion time, we can think of, of of lots more words. Now I know that you asked me to ruminate on the 40 years of the movement, which is. First, there are two problems for me with that. One is that it's like saying, describe the universe and give two examples. <laughs> and, and the other is that I live in the future. You know, so I think we all have a habit of mind that we develop early. And I was so trying to get out of Toledo that I, I developed this habit of mind. No, no, you know, nothing about Toledo, mind you, just the part I was in. <laughs> Toledo, which taught me, which was the poor part, the bad part, which
which taught me early that all second class things or inferior things require an adjective. And the superior thing takes the noun. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, there's women writers and black scientists, and but there's writers and scientists, you know. So that's another word thing that, <laughs> that we can work on. Um, and of course, we have come a huge, huge, huge long distance in 40 years. I mean, 40 years ago, I was doing some writing at the Smithsonian here. Uh, at the Red Castle, where they have the Woodrow Wilson Fellowships. And I had the woman's office, because they only had one woman, you know, among all of the scholars. And the one preceding me had been Gertrude Himmelfarb. And Gertrude Himmelfarb had written an entire thesis on how the idea of poverty was a function of affluent societies. Because if the societies wouldn't, weren't affluent, you wouldn't have a concept of poverty. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so, so we've, you know, <laughs> we've come uh, a long distance uh, from that. Um, and I think that we have come a very uh, long distance in terms of consciousness. You know, if you think about it, 30 or 40 years ago, we were still having to prove that women uh, deserved equal pay much less needed it since we were thought to be working for pin money. Um, and, um, you know, even though, of course, we haven't even got to equal pay yet, uh, at least we now have huge, you know, like over between 60 and 70 percent majority of the public agrees that it should be, uh, it, that it should be equal. But it is also still true that it is so unequal as you all know, we moved from 50-something to 70-something on the dollar. But it is still so unequal. And so, I'm sorry to say, separate from economic considerations. That in this last campaign, when we were uh, talking about economic stimulus, not once outside of the women's movement that I'm aware of was equal pay discussed as a stimulus. In spite of the fact that equal pay or female human beings of all races alone in this country would bring $200 billion more a year into the economy. The average uh, white woman would earn 100 and something more a week. The average woman of color, 300 and something more a week compared to the uh, white male doing the same work. And, you know, you know that those women are not going to put it in a Swiss bank account. No, <laughs> they're going to spend it and create jobs. And yet, that was not part of our national discussion. So I think we're still in a place where um, the adjective to the noun takes us away from the general, even though we are 50% of, of the general. Now, I, in, in terms of, of living in the future, um, I just want to say that one of the, the reasons I'm, I'm grateful to the uh, thinkers uh, whose thought was generated by the welfare system is that Teresa Funicello, whom some of you remember, who wrote a book called Who Creates the Poor, um, was the, from being a welfare recipient, learned and became an economic theorist, and has developed something that once we are no longer so totally consumed with fighting not to lose, we might proceed to win. Um, and I don't know if you've talked about this or not, which is that we not only need to um, revalue work, which is what we're trying to do, because right now work is mainly valued by who does it not by the work itself. So parking lot attendants, who are mostly men, get paid more than childcare attendants, who are mostly women, not because we care more about cars than our children, but because, as we all know, the labor force is still profoundly uh, sex and race and paper degree uh, segregated. Um, 
So what we yes, we need to revalue work and we need to proceed with that. But we also need to redefine work. I mean, in the same way that early on we tried hard and still try hard to never say uh, about homemakers that they don't work since they work longer and harder than any class of worker in this country. But talk about women who work at home, or men who work at home, or outside the home. Uh, we are also, thanks to Teresa and other thinkers, able, I believe, to take the third of the work in the country, which is um, I mean, you can call it nurturing work, or you can, I mean, it's, it's raising baby humans, a very interesting <laughs> occupation, or it's taking care of elderly relatives, or of uh, AIDS patients, or with that, all of that caregiving work is, as we know, a third of the productive work in the country. The country could not possibly function without it, and yet there is no way of measuring it, and it has no attributed economic. It is possible to have an attributed economic value, and some other countries have begun to think about this, and even to do it, which is to attribute an economic value to that work at a replacement level, and make, whether it's done by women or men, but since you know it's done 90% by women, it would have a disproportionate, obvious impact uh, on, on women, and make that sum of money tax deductible if we pay taxes, and tax refundable if we're too poor to pay taxes. The substituting, which of course the origin of welfare had only to do with widows, not in its, in its origins, right? So, you know, we could redefine work. We could finally include all productive work in this country. We can't do economic planning without that. It's just not a possibility. And it is in our national interest to reward caregiving at home economically by making an attributed value tax deductible. Because by and large, caregiving done at home is less expensive and better in quality than institutional care. Not always, but by and large, it is, it is the case. So, you know, it is in the, the interest of especially women, but also men who are caregivers. And it is in the national interest to think in a different way economically. There are plenty of things in the budget that have an attributed economic value. Uh, and we could do this. We could do this. It would be a change in tax policy. It wouldn't even require, I don't believe, the experts of Washington can tell me this, but I don't believe it would require a separate bill. It would simply be a change in tax policy. And we did struggle and get the principle of refundability, so we have at least that principle. So that's one um, future possibility, I believe. And the other, um, the other, I would say, most important strains of the future are, are within us and among us, but not yet quite developed. And some of it is due to the natural stages of social justice movements, which are kind of like a person. You know, first, um, you're dependent and you're defined by others. You're a child, you're a dependent uh, in status and power. Then you're independent, and that's an absolutely crucial stage because you get to name yourself and the power of naming and being visible, and there you are, and you're now, um, and, you know, you can't skip over independence. No, it's very important. But I think that we need to realize more that we are interdependent. And that is true of us as movements. Uh, we need to have our own names, you know, as the gay and lesbian movement, uh, uh, the Native American movement, the <coughs> feminist movement, uh, the uh, civil rights movement, of course, that gave birth to us all. That, you know, we need to have those in independent names and be visible. But I fear sometimes that our adversaries understand our connections better than we do. Because they're against all of us, as you may have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Including the environmental movement. All right, so the same people are, um, you, 
you know, I mean, on campuses, kids will say to me, why is it that the same groups are against lesbians and birth control? <laughs>
60% of undocumented women work outside of their homes, many in jobs where employment is temporary, informal, or unverifiable. Think about domestic caregiving and service work. The remaining 40% work at home taking care of children and families. A plan that attaches citizenship to proof of work would leave out these millions upon millions of women. Um, two, uh, we can quit, uh, we can stop um, counting or trapping skilled workers as dependents on their husbands. Currently, only 27% of all principal visa holders, those authorized to work, in other words, are women. Since the majority of, of uh, principal visa holders are men, it follows that two-thirds are dependent on their husbands. Immigrant women in the dependent visa category are not allowed to work, even though they have the same level of attainment, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, no matter what they have, they are not allowed to work in the same way as if they were native-born women. In other words, they are forced to be economically, socially, in every way dependent on their husbands because they're visa holders. Um, three, um, don't make women wait 20 years to unite with their families. Since 70% of women enter this country uh, by the family channel, that is because of dependence here, uh, they are the most subject, by far, to the outdated, ridiculous regulations um, that have to do with importing uh, immediate relatives. For instance, if you are from Mexico, the Philippines, or India, the wait time is as long as 20 years to join your immediate family. Same-gender partners are excluded from this altogether. So they're not even in the waiting line if you're the same gender partner. Four, make the US once again a safe haven for survivors of violence and trafficking. We all worked, many of you probably in this room worked hard to uh, allow amnesty to women, to victims of domestic violence and attempted murder by their partners and all, you know, we, and FGM, female genital mutilation. We worked very hard on this, and it held until uh, about 1996. So there was a history of protecting such survivors. But everything changed under that Congress of 96. Lawmakers created new barriers for asylum seekers. And in the years since, policymakers have con continued making it easier for survivors of gender violence including sexual assault, to be deported to their countries of persecution. This, um, and in fact, I don't know how many noticed this in VAWA. We were all glad that VAWA passed and that, you know, won a couple of battles there. But it does um, eliminate a tiny expansion of the number of visas for immigrant women to come forward and report uh, severe domestic violence and fear of, of retribution. Five, protect families and ensure due process. This is probably what you as social workers know better than any, anybody. About 23% of all deportations in a, in the just measured in a two year period were issued for parents who had children who were U.S. citizens. The stunning number of deportations taking place each year, over 400,000 in last year alone, 400,000 deportations in 2012 alone, have left tens of thousands of families destroyed and torn apart by these outdated laws. Um, there is a bill introduced by uh, California's Congresswoman Roy Ball, Roy Ball Allard, uh, to fix this so that, um, it, and to integrate it into the immigration reform legislation, that that bill would provide protective protections for deported parents and for undocumented family members who care for young dependent children. And finally, allow women to fully integrate into society. Approximately 10 million 
and immigrant women speak limited English and need help from the federal government to learn our language and our laws and ensure that they can contribute their skills to this nation. English classes that currently exist often exclude women because um, they are tied to workforce training or because they take place at community colleges that require a basic level of English in the first place. Uh, or they are held at times that are impossible for people who take care of children. Immigration reform legislation that includes an English language requirement without addressing this inability on the part of millions of women to have equal access to English education um, will disadvantage future generations. So I, I just want to say to you, this is, <laughs> this room is full of the people who know the most, who have the most courage, who are at the juncture of those with more power, those with too little power, and those with too much. <laughs> and we have to say it. No, I, I, I was on the plane to Boston from New York, and I was sitting across the aisle from a woman who was herself a venture capitalist, very successful, going to lecture at Harvard. Uh, we discovered that neither of us had any respect for the Harvard Business School where she was about <laughs> to go lecture. <laughs> decided that we should give a joint course <laughs> with a seminar, sub-seminar. The course was called Money is Boring, <laughs> parents, unless you do something creative with it. I mean, you know, because, you know, once you have as much as you need, what, you know, and look at all the people who just collected, you know, the men who are so insecure that they just collected. No wonder wealth is masculinized. And then, then we had a little sub-seminar called What is Enough? Because this society doesn't realize what is enough. And it is an illness that is not just destroying us as individuals, but, not to be grandiose here, but is destroying the planet. When you look at the consumption rate in this country of natural, of all the planet's resources. So, um, I thank you for being the group that understands that we can be linked, not ranked. Uh, and for understanding that uh, God may be in the details, but the goddess is in the connections.